<laughs> What's up? You want a treat? Oh, Dogs are kind of these like very present things. You know, they don't have so much. They do on some level that, you know, maybe we'll never know. How much are they thinking of the future? How much are they thinking of the past? Like, who knows? But the first, like every time you come home is like the first time that you've come home, you know? And like, it doesn't matter. You, I could walk out of the house for 30 minutes and then, you know, that cutie, my new dog, like she's just like, oh my God, you're back, you're back. Joy is always sort of accessible, you know? And, and even though we're humans and I think we do focus entirely too much on the future and, and the past, you can really only experience joy in the present. And I think dogs are just so present. You know, I think they're so, all of a sudden their whole state, they can go from like dead asleep to like, you know, having the time of their life or, or switch to another emotion, you know, really, really fast. And I think it, it's all in a real time sort of thing. It doesn't mean they don't want to go play fetch or go for a walk or something, but it, I think it's something beautiful. I think humans somehow love dogs because of that. We produced a documentary for HBO um, about war dogs. Um, and that, that brought us into a whole community of army rangers and their, and their um, dogs that they work with in the special forces. And then, and then Chan uh, lost, his, lost his dog and, and that kind of spawned a, a connection between something personal and, and this experience we had just gone through. Briggs all he needs is a, basically a, a referral. You know, he needs to get his captain to, to call uh, the, the diplomatic security company and, and just vouch for him. Say he's a squared away soldier and that's, that's what he wants. To get that, he has to take Lulu on this road trip from, from basically the Pacific Northwest all the way down to kind of very close to the, to the Mexican border. It's gonna be a handful. You know, you think just putting a dog in a car and just driving it down there is enough, but one of these dogs is, and this guy also, uh, they're both special let's just say and and they're they're gonna they're gonna fight each other all the way down the down the coast and and uh and if he does that and if he gets lulu to this funeral without any without anything that happens bad then he gets the referral where you get a guy and a dog in the car and both of them really just kind of are trained to bite and neither one of them listen to each other and they have sort of competing agendas in life all sorts of chaos ensues slowly he actually starts to take care of this dog. <laughs> like he's, he, we definitely did not want to be heavy handed about this. If anything, we, we almost wanted this to be unintelligible in the movie other than to us. Like the dog is him, you know, they, they're just mirrors for each other. He kind of, I think, discovers this connection and this sort of just want to connect with this dog. And it's not even, I don't think it's even conscious. They're basically both, they're both animals. They're both kind of like feral animals. They, they don't think before they act. And that's where a lot of the comedy comes from. That's where a lot of the, the kind of wildness of the movie comes from. But they're both along the way showing each other these aspects of themselves that they're not really paying attention to. There's a scene where I run out to the car and Zeus is in the car because Zeus is going, going ape in the car. And, and I have to open the door and be like, what? And like scream and be really aggressive. Like, you know, what do you want? And because Zuzu is like my friend, like in real life, she was just like, oh my God, what did I do? Like I was only doing what I was, what I was supposed to do. Why am I getting yelled at right now? Her ears like went back and I was like, oh, <laughs> it like broke my heart. Cause I was like, no, no, we're homies. So like we, each and after every one of those scenes, I would have to go over and be like, no, it's okay. Like you're, you're my friend. They must think I am out of my mind. Channing and I started working with the dogs about nine months before we started shooting. Uh, a lot of that was because of the pandemic setting in and us realizing, okay, we can't shoot for a while, so let's spend the time with the dogs. As we were writing, Channing would be in the backyard, you know, training with the dogs. And that was awesome. It, it really, I mean, that's the foundational relationship of the movie. And, and honestly, if I could have taken two years to work on that with them, I, I would have like it, it, you can't have enough time. Yeah, I think that's one of the special things about the movie is I imagine that in most animal movies, you hire a, a animal trainer and they kind of come in and they show up on set and they're like, okay, the dog's gonna do this and that. And the actor's gonna stay over here and we're gonna get that shot and that shot. And then it's like, hey, and we're done. And this was much different. They would all know the word rolling and action because it, it, it was a prompt for them. And that happened on the day one. Day one, third, third take, second take even, you know, because we had rehearsed something before that. Like, as soon as they yelled, rolling, and then everyone yells, rolling around set, and all the energy goes up. 
and you don't want the dog's energy to be up because you want it to be calm and chill and not pull you around. These dogs are just so smart. Like they're incredibly smart and they love working. It's what they wake up. They wake up in the morning and they're like, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? Where are we going? How do we get to do it? Let's do it as many times as we possibly can. Please don't, like, let's not go to sleep. You know, the amazing thing about working with Chan, well, there's, there's many, but the, I think the, the most prominent one is that he doesn't have a false bone in his body. So he will never approach a problem or an idea from a place of convention, and he will never approach a, like a creative situation from, from a logical place of like, well, the best thing for act one would be, or, you know, I really feel like I should be perceived like, like he's never, the artifice of being a movie star has not eroded his soul. You know, like he's, he's unapologetically who he is, truthful. It's like a tuning fork that I get to follow as a writer, as a director, as a creator on all fronts. Like I know that if it's not working, it's because he's, it's not truthful for him. I think one thing that, that Reed has almost head and shoulders above everybody, and not just because he's 6'6", is that he actually wants to know what they're understanding. Like, he's like, all right, what are you, what are you getting? Like, what? And, he, and he's really trying to have them put themselves into the character, into the movie. And then that comes, I think, from the writing that he, and where he's, what he's learned in the writing process as well, is he, he really wants people to have a say and to be a part of the creative process and not for it to be a dictatorship. His ability to see the 30,000 foot view, he's taught me more about movies than almost any of the directors that I've, that I've worked with that are some of the best directors in the world. I don't know how, anyone could make a story about the military without including real veterans. I'm not really sure how I could ever do that. And so it was like, we have to, if they don't, if they're not involved, we can't go this route. We wanted to show what it might be like for someone to feel that sense of disconnection from their community and to want it back. Oftentimes, movies about war are about the traumas and the horrors of war and why, why war is sort of bad. And, I, and we really wanted to make, not make a moral judgment on war and just understand from a soldier's point of view why you might really miss and want that type of experience again because it was the only thing that made you feel alive and made you feel part of something and gave you that sense of meaning and identity. They're both pretty insane. They're both pretty, they're, they'll, they'll definitely go, they'll go until they can't go anymore. And, and, I, and I think when you have two brick eaters that are ready to that are ready to lock up at any point. You know that you can have fireworks almost at any moment in the movie. That there's a there's an actual gun in that car. Two guns essentially. Like that are like a, it's a powder keg. It can pop off at any moment. And and they're equal matches for each other. There's a there's a moment where where we like we both grab a you know a, a, this like stuffed unicorn. And look, it, like. The unicorn was never gonna stay together if, if one of us didn't, like, wasn't either told to let go or if didn't just let go before it ripped because it would have just been done, like, in, in a heartbeat. And uh, so it's it's just funny. They're, they're equal match. And the only difference between them is that one's a canine and one's a, one's a human. <laughs> Human-ish. You're a juvie. You miss all. Yes. Yes, you're twice as big. Twice as big in one week. Dude, they were like, you gotta, I had to buy this collar. Yeah.